Um, so I just want to start off with some welcomes. Thank you for joining us this evening for our virtual AGM. I'm very happy to have everyone with us tonight. Um, I am Nicola Holness. I am the board chair for Black Creek Community Health Center, and I will be facilitating the session tonight. Um, along with me, I have the rest of the Black Creek Health Center board members. Uh, feel free to wave everyone else so that you know who is with us today. I also have um, Executive Director Cheryl Prescott, as well as other members of the Black Creek team. I also want to make a special welcome to all the community members who are joining us, partners and other supporters of Black Creek Health Center. So welcome. Next slide. So before we get started, I just want to run through a few technical reminders since um, this is really new for a lot of people using a Zoom platform. So the first thing I want to say is please try to mute yourself and reduce as much background noise as possible. Um, on your screen, you should see in the uh, left-hand corner a button that allows you to mute your um, to mute everything, as well as use the video button to come in and out of the AGM as well. Feel free to start your video if you're interested in joining us. You can also use the chat function to communicate with us throughout the meeting. So the chat function would be at the right um, side corner of your screen. And that's an opportunity to ask questions or make comments throughout the AGM. Um, when you are, if you are deciding to use the chat button, it would be really helpful if you could begin by typing your full name so that we can include you in our AGM attendance. Also something, something to keep in mind, if you are joining us by phone, uh, just be mindful that um, in order to mute or unmute yourself, you will have to press star six. And if you want to raise your hand to make a comment or ask a question, then you would have to press star nine. Uh, other than that, we encourage you all to be active on our social media page if you can throughout the meeting. And our hashtag is hashtag BCCHCAGM. Next slide. Okay, so um, I'm gonna start off with the agenda. So the agenda is on your screen. Um, this is the breakdown of the evening. So we're going, I'm going to start off with a land acknowledgement um, that'll be followed by a keynote address and then we'll get into the AGM business. So I'm just gonna start off with the land acknowledgement. So while this meeting is on a virtual platform, it's important to acknowledge the land on which we are on today. The lands that are now Toronto are the traditional territory of many nations. Today, Toronto is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island and is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. We are grateful to live and work with them and with newcomers on this territory. Living on this territory makes all people in Toronto treaty people, including those who come as settlers, immigrants, newcomers in this generation or generations past. We would also like to acknowledge those who came forci forcibly, uh, particularly as a result of the transatlantic slave trade. We honor and we pay tribute to all of our ancestors. Next slide. Okay, so next on the agenda, we have Dr. Allen, who will be uh, delivering our keynote address. I will be uh, presenting um, Dr. Allen's bio, and then he will take it away from there. So Dr. Upton Allen is the Division Health of Infectious Disease at the Hospital for Sick Children, also known as Sick Kids, a consultant in infectious disease, Interim Medical Director of the Transplant Center and Senior Associate Scientist at the Research Institute's Child Health Eval Evaluation Sciences. His research interests include infections in immunocompromised patients and transplant related infections. A secondary area of research relates to vaccine and vaccination strategies for children with weakened immune systems. He is also a professor in pediatrics and health policy management and evaluation at the University of Toronto. 
Dr. Allen is currently leading a research team assessing COVID-19 prevalence, risk factors among Black Canadian communities. As Canada prepares for the possibility of a second wave of infection, understanding the level of immunity and unique risk factors for Black Canadian population will be key to developing a robust, equitable safety measures. As we are located in one of the city's COVID-19 hospitals, which also happens to be home to a large number of Black Canadians, Black Creek Community Health Center has been involved in supporting the recruitment of individuals for this research project. We welcome Dr. Allen to provide us with an update of the COVID-19 pandemic situation and to answer some of the questions that are on the minds of members in the community. So Dr. Allen, I will be turning this over to you. Thank and you very much. Let me uh, start by really thanking you very much indeed for inviting me uh, to be here uh, and to share a few moments with you. I look forward to the many questions that I'm sure that you will have. I thought I would share a few slides with you uh, to bring out uh, a few key points relating to COVID uh, as, it, as we interact with uh, the virus that causes COVID-19 uh, in our homes, in the environment, schools, work, wherever we might be. This slide uh, is a slide from 1918-1919. And I hope you can see that clearly. And it's, I put this to remind us of um, where we've been with respect to uh, the previous great pandemic that caused the lo loss of um, many lives around the world. This is 1918, 1919, the great uh, influenza pandemic. And as you can see, uh, this was um, a makeshift hospital uh, that was essentially a warehouse that was turned into a hospital. And indeed, more recently with COVID, there were situations pretty close to this with uh, tent type uh, makeshift, makeshift hospitals um, in different parts of the world, uh, including the United States. So we don't want to uh, get to this at all. I will share with you a few slides that relate to the virus uh, that causes COVID, the SARS coronavirus to in the environment. And this slide shows what happens when someone coughs or sneezes, particles um, uh, get dispersed for um, several feet. Most of the uh, uh, particles that actually would infect individuals are within that six feet range as this relates to COVID. For viruses like measles, that is an airborne virus, it's predominantly airborne, then you essentially can get measles if somebody was in a room and you happen to just walk through the room. COVID is not like that, uh, though there's some controversy regarding under what circumstances might some of the particles uh, remain suspended in the air for uh, more prolonged periods of time. But for the most part, we're looking at that six feet zone as the, the buffer zone uh, of safety, so to speak. I, I put this slide up to show you what happens when someone sneezes or coughs. And you can actually see the spray that uh, uh, comes out of the person's um, uh, upper respirator tract, in this case, the mouth. Uh, and indeed, you can just imagine uh, someone who is unprotected in terms of a face covering or a mask, how uh, that, you know, they could get infected if, if these um, particles uh, carry viruses. Uh, and so you can uh, also imagine what would happen if somebody has a mask on. Um, if you do have viral particles uh, uh, emanating from someone's mouth, that chances are it won't be as many as you see here in the unprotected uh, type of exposure. Now, these, uh, the next two slides are really quite interesting. 
And this, um, this is work that was done by uh, investigators that looked at the survival of the uh, virus that causes COVID on different surfaces. At the top where you can see my cursor, we have paper like printing paper, tissue paper, wood, clothing and glass. And anything in the red shows where the virus was detected. Anything in green means that the virus was not detected. And essentially what the investigators did is that they spiked the material with the virus and let it uh, rest for several hours and days and then went back to see if they could detect the virus. And on, on paper, printing paper, by three hours in the environment at regular room temperature, they could no longer detect the uh, virus that causes COVID. On tissue paper, at three hours, they could no longer detect the virus. In the case of wood, it was longer, two days. By two days, they couldn't detect the virus. On regular clothing, like you know what we wear, two days. So it sort of gives you an idea of uh, how long the virus might survive on a surface, such as a desk or on your clothing material. But then glass, it was longer. Glass was out to four days. Again, giving you an idea of how long the virus might survive uh, on uh, glass material within the home environment, school or work. But let's go further. Let's look at, this is a fun one. Let's look at um, paper money, four days. Stainless steel was out to a week. So now we are looking at certain, some types of, um, of uh, uh, door handles, for example, it might be longer and plastic, again, certain types of um, plastics, uh, things that you could think of that might be in the office or home environment uh, out to a week. And on mass, the inner side of a mass, and this is rather fascinating, uh, the inner layer of a mass, the, this experiment was done with surgical masks. But the inner layer of the surgical mask, uh, by about a week, they could no longer detect virus. But the outer layer of a surgical mask, even after a week, they were still able to detect some amount of virus. So it gives you an idea of the uh, survival of the uh, SARS uh, coronavirus 2 on different uh, surfaces. So this is. Um, uh, I hope um, helpful to you. Uh, the ones that we have to think about most are on plastic and steel. I say, you know, think about a, of a, about a week um, on clothing, think, you know, the next day, so two days um, on glass, add an extra day to that. Um, so by, you know, the, the fourth day or so um, on regular paper, you're looking at um, just a matter of a few hours. So I hope you found that useful. Now we, we hear a lot about flattening the curve. Um, and I hope that by now we all know what that means. Essentially without uh, control measures, one, has, uh, one will experience a huge spike in the number of COVID cases uh, and there will come a point where the, the capacity of the healthcare system becomes overwhelmed. And one doesn't want that to happen. So essentially the difference between these two curves is that the area under the curve is about the same, meaning the total number of cases occurring are roughly identical. The difference is the second curve, the cases are occurring over a longer period of time as opposed to a shorter period. Shorter period, healthcare system gets overwhelmed. A longer period of a time, you, you have more of a mound, a sort of flatter curve, and the healthcare system is not overwhelmed. And so this is what one wants to have in place with measures that control the spread of COVID. Overwhelming the healthcare system is an incredibly a scary thing, and I can tell you, uh, as a healthcare worker, you know, I, I was really worried about this um, in mid-April or so, uh, and certainly talking to my colleagues in places like New York, they were really um, very concerned. 
Now, I want to show you this slide. This again goes back to 1918, uh, 1919, and, and it shows uh, the uh, three waves of the influenza in the UK uh, as reflected by uh, mortality from influenza and pneumonia. These are thought to mirror the number of cases of COVID of uh, influenza that were happening at that time. But um, you know, as I watch, uh, as I looked at this slide, it, it's a sort of a funny type of feeling because um, the first wave you're looking at, you know, June ended ended um, in July, end of July. August was a pretty good month, uh, and then. <laughs> This week, um, in, in, in uh, September 1918, was when the second wave started. Um, and as you can see, there was this huge chunk of a second wave that went all the way through November and December, settled down in January a bit, and then there was a third smaller wave, February, March, ending in April. So what we want to avoid is, we want to avoid this huge second wave. That's really crucial. Uh, and and what, what I must say um, to you though, is that the regular uh, cycle of respiratory viruses is such that round about now, one usually starts to see us enter the respiratory viral season. And that's where we start to see more common colds and more flus and more RSVs and you know par influenza and all those viruses, and they typically start to appear round about now, and they typically end round about middle of March. So essentially, what we're faced with at the moment, I believe, is COVID, the virus that causes COVID getting a bit of a running start. So it's essentially, rather than starting from ground zero, like other viruses that are seasonal, COVID is not starting from ground zero, it's getting a bit of a running start. And so potentially um, what you have uh, is a, a virus that is now for this, for this season, almost behaving like a seasonal virus but with a running start. And so potentially there's a possibility that we could have a, quite a significant wave. The good thing is that we have six months or seven months of learning behind us to prevent that from happening. So I think that's an important point uh, for us to um, bear in mind. I wanna share with you the next um, two slides, which I, I think um, bring out a number of points of uh, real importance to uh, uh, community uh, health, centers. And this, uh, th these uh, data were generated uh, by the uh, City of Toronto and basically shows the share of COVID-19 cases by household income compared to the share of people living in Toronto by that particular income group. And uh, blue represents your share of the population and gray represents your share of COVID. At the extreme end are individuals making up greater than 150,000 or more. And basically they make up 21% of the population, but only 6% of COVID cases. In a fair world, in a fair world, if you make up 21% of the population, you should get 21% of COVID in a fair world. Um, at the other extreme, uh, individuals making less than 30,000 per year, and they make up 14% of the population, but they're getting more COVID, 27% of uh, you know, COVID. And the, 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 the guys in the middle making somewhere between 50 and um, uh, $70,000 a year, they're closer to you know, being balanced in terms of um, their share of the population, um, and um, the share of COVID cases. So basically, um, lower income folks um, are experiencing COVID more than folks at the other end. Then our data relating to 
ethno-racial groups um, within Toronto. Again, the share of the population is in this um, mustard colored uh, bars, um, and then the share of COVID in the gray bars. And if you look at the white population in Toronto, it makes up about 50% of the population, 48% to be exact. But let's say 50% of the population and takes home, if I may use that phrase, 17% of COVID cases. Um, and I, I often say to my students, let's, um, let's imagine this was a huge pizza um, with, with 10 slices. Whites, uh, so as the population is concerned, would take home five slices for their share of the population. But they would get less than two slices of pizza for COVID. If you take uh, Blacks, on the other hand, they would get one slice of the population, uh, you know, if it were a huge pizza, but they're taking home two slices. So they're taking home more than they deserve in terms of the, the, the um, using the pizza analogy. Uh, and, and so anywhere the gray bar is taller than the uh, mustard colored bar, it means that the population is disproportionately affected by COVID. You can see uh, Arab, Middle Eastern, West Asian, Blacks, Latin Americans, uh, South Asians, Indo-Caribbean, uh, Southeast Asians, the, the, the gray bar exceeds the other bar with the exception of whites and East Asians. So, so this gives an idea of the groups that are disproportionately represented among COVID cases. And so uh, work that uh, is being done by people like myself and others uh, is really aimed at trying to get a better understanding of why this is happening so that in the end, we can better um, help individuals and help the community. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, I'll stop sharing my slides, or maybe you could stop sharing them. Me, yeah, here we go. Um, and I'll turn it back over to you, Nicola. All right, thank you, Dr. Allen. That information was very informative and insightful. And I think those last few slides um, really speak to the issues that we see um, in the Black Creek community. Um, so thank you for that. Um, as you can expect, members of the community have a lot of questions. Um, we just got declared second wave today. So we had asked um, attendees to submit questions before the session um, that we can share with you and hopefully you could try to address some of those questions. Um, I'll start with a few questions that we have and then we'll also open it up to the chat um, so that people can try to ask questions that um, may just be populating in their head. Um, I just want to remind everyone, especially those on the phone, um, just a reminder, if you want to unmute yourself to ask a question or to mute yourself, it's star uh, six. And if you want to raise your hand so you can ask a question or make a comment, it is star nine. So I'll start with the first question, Dr. Allen, which is... Oh, oh sorry. I just hear some people in the background. So please try to mute your phone. Um, if that's possible, thanks. Um, okay, so the first question is, so with schools reopening this fall, many of us are worried about the exposure of children. So um, the fir first part of the question would be, what does the data tell us about COVID-19 infection rates for children? And can you also tell us how does COVID-19 affect children differently from adults? Oh, thank you very much. That's a, that's a great question. Um, uh, as far as the data relating to COVID in children overall, uh, most of the uh, data that we have so far indicate that uh, adults are uh, more often uh, being affected by COVID uh, than children, significantly uh, more so than children. That said, we are well aware of the fact that uh, the data that have been generated were generated uh, at a time when children were uh, at home. And so as we move forward uh, into the fall, the reopening of schools, 
uh, we expect that we will see more uh, infection in children. But overall, um, one still expects that most of the cases will be occurring uh, in adults, but we, we, you know, but children can still be uh, infected uh, with COVID. That's um, uh, well known. Uh, children uh, generally have a milder illness. Overall, the vast majority of kids, when they get infected, they have a mild illness. But that doesn't mean that they cannot have a severe illness, and they can. Um, and, and some kids can even die from, from COVID. So, but overall, for the vast majority of children, uh, COVID is a mild illness. Okay. Um, just to kind of follow up on that, how can grandparents and other older adults who live with children that are attending school, how can they best protect themselves? So, so that's a really great question. Um, that uh, many people um, are, are struggling with. So how best um, to protect individuals in the home uh, who uh, might be more vulnerable because of um, coexisting medical conditions as well as um, uh, age. Uh, and, you know, it, it is, there's no perfect solution, but one of the things that we and others are working on, in fact, that me and my colleagues now, we're trying to develop a document to help provide some guidance around that, is to uh, identify ways that people can prevent uh, or reduce the risk of spread within the home. Uh, it is difficult uh, when you're living in situations that just don't allow for much isolation within the home. So there, there won't be a one size fit all approach at all. So one needs to be aware of that. And so what is needed is close collaboration between uh, diverse experts and, uh, and uh, public health to ensure that we have uh, guidance and recommendations for people within the home uh, to reduce the risk of uh, transmitting infection. In situations where it is just not possible to isolate people within the home, then one has to look at how one puts in place um, uh, measures to support isolation outside of the home. Uh, and so there are you know, different ways that that can be done. But it is a million dollar question. We don't have the answers yet, but I can tell you that we and others are uh, working on some guidance to help to, to uh, you know, provide some information that might be useful to people, recognizing that for some families, isolating in the home is no big deal because they have so much space, but there are lots of individuals who are not able to do that properly at all. But it's a great, great question, a major concern. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna give more time for uh, some questions to come through the chat, but for now I'll go to this next question. So statistics show that more young adults aged uh, 20 to 40 are getting the virus. Um, I know a lot of this uh, people are being told is attributed to gatherings and bars and stuff like that, but could this also be related to risks associated with traveling to work and doing some type of work? So, you know, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really great question. Um, one of the observations um, during the 19, 18, 19, uh, 19 pandemic was that individuals who were traveling to work um, were in fact getting uh, influenza and were having you know, uh, uh, mortality as a result of that. So we know that's a risk factor, but um, uh, there's no evidence that that is what's happening here so far. Um, uh, the extent to which um, that might be contributing it obviously needs to be fleshed out, uh, but there, there's a concern that um, uh, people are getting together in, um, in, in ways that they shouldn't. Um, and the truth is that um, even if they are uh, getting together and they're not transmitting infection, uh, getting together in large groups, um, you know, is just not the right thing to do. All right. 
I am going to uh, turn it over uh, to the chat box now. So I have a question. How can we work together to, um, sorry, how can we work together to increase resources and channel these to the most affected communities as identified by the City of Toronto report? Right, so how can we increase, sorry, how can we work together to increase resources, to request an increase of resources? Francois, do you want to clarify your question? Well, you know, one, one of the things that I think um, uh, is, is really worth stating, there, there is no question that one needs to direct resources at areas um, in need of those resources by virtue of um, the number of cases that are occurring. The, the, the nature of the resources though, um, uh, really d does require further study. What's required in one community might not be what is required in the next community. And to give you an example, um, in, in some uh, communities, um, one might argue that um, the supports that are needed um, relate to um, the types of jobs people are doing so that um, they don't have to do th two or three jobs, four jobs to make ends meet. And if you are, um, you know, exa an example that I, that I use is that if you are a PSW and you have to work four different jobs to make ends meet, you're, you're quadrupling your exposures. And so that's, you know, example. So should one be looking at creative ways of supporting individuals like that? How do people um, get to work on the types of transportation that they take? Um, so there are many aspects to um, support and it definitely needs to um, be looked at very carefully, um, particularly through, um, during the next several months as to what are the needs of the various communities. And I do agree that we all need to come together to uh, identify those needs so that people can get the support that they need. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, I have another question from the chat. So we're hearing that the COVID-19 virus is more acute for Black Americans. Are we also seeing worse outcomes for Black Canadians who have been affected? If so, are there any theories about why? Um, the, the early data that came out um, from the United States um, showed that um, uh, Black Americans were disproportionately being affected in terms of bad outcomes like uh, mortality um, and, uh, and um, you know, morbidity admission to hospitals. The same with um, uh, their UK counterparts. And in, in Canada, we, we, we haven't fleshed that out as neatly as Americans have and the UK folks have done that. Um, and so we, we are in the process of trying to do that. What we can say though, is that, um, uh, um, there are data, as I showed you, that um, show that uh, Black uh, folks um, are being disproportionately affected. And uh, we know that there are risk factors uh, within the Black community that may be associated with poorer outcomes. But those risk factors are present in other groups as well. But it's just that um, if the risk factors are present in a group that gets lots of COVID, and present in another group that also gets um, you know, COVID but fewer numbers, then you're gonna see more in the cases where the risk factors are present. And, and so we need to tease out the Canadian data some more. And that's some of the work that we're trying to, to flesh out. Now with respect to why, um, beyond the risk factors uh, of um, uh, medical coexisting conditions, um, uh, we, we don't know yet. Uh, but certainly one of the obvious things are the coexisting medical conditions that have been identified as being risk factors uh, for uh, bad outcomes from COVID. Okay. All right, I'm going to jump back uh, to some questions we had from community. So, um, Today, the federal government announced more investments, in, or not today, but the announcement was made for more investments in testing and contact tracing, um, including resources to isolate cases. 
how important is it to get tested and how can people who test positive best self-isolate? Uh, the testing is most important um, for uh, individuals who are symptomatic uh, so that you don't want people who are um, asymptomatic to be um, at the front of the line for testing compared with people who are symptomatic. That's number one. Testing is also quite relevant to individuals in uh, hot zones where there are risk factors um, that are associated with uh, increased chances of poor outcomes um, from COVID. Uh, the various um, mechanisms for testing, as you know, are being worked out uh, you know, across the province. Uh, so uh, one just needs to uh, be plugged into your local uh, health center, public health, your local physicians to get a better understanding of um, the uh, criteria for testing in your areas and, and where to get testing, where, where to get tested. How to self-isolate um, is what we alluded to earlier. And it's not a one size um, fit all scenario at all. Um, I, I believe though that um, uh, to the point about the resources, I do believe that um, we need to look at this really more carefully to determine uh, how best to support people who need to, to self-isolate. If, you, if you're living in a home with your 90 year old uh, grandmother, um, you know, and your 70-year-old um, uh, uh, grandfather who happens to have emphysema and heart disease, and you have COVID, and you can't isolate, you will infect them and they will die. They have a high chance of that. So, so we just need to work out a way to protect those individuals. And that's um, an extremely important thing that um, uh, is being looked at to provide ways to support uh, those individuals who need to um, properly isolate so that they don't um, uh, infect um, highly vulnerable uh, individuals. Okay, uh, Dr. Allen, we have a bit of a active chat going on here, so bear with me, but I'm gonna uh, kind of circle back to the resources question because I feel like um, I got some clarification on what that looked like. So in your presentation, you mentioned about, you know, um, the disparities of COVID-19 amongst the Black community. Um, and given uh, the position of Black Creek, we're in a predominantly racialized community. How can neighboring organizations in this Black Creek area, is there something that we can be doing to get together so that we can increase uh, resources in the community? And I'm just going to start, I'm just going to try to tie that in with another comment that speaks to things like systemic issues that are not really um, being considered, like transit in the communities, um, schools that are not really, are not responding well to COVID-19, things like that. Like, so are there other systemic things that um, different organizations within the community can or should be doing to help build up resources and get uh, better support from government? And I am hope I'm asking questions right. So. Feel free to continue. Well, I, I, think, I think that's a really important point. Um, I, I think that the process of identifying how different groups can come together uh, to uh, itemize what sort of resources are needed, I think it's really important. Um, but it really starts with identifying who the key players are and getting them uh, to talk to each other and getting them around the table and say, okay, you know, how, what are we gonna bring to the table that will benefit the community based on what we see are the major needs? Um, whatever those needs are in terms of um, uh, support, supportive isolation, um, uh, transportation, uh, whatever. Um, uh, providing uh, meals for people so they don't have to travel long distances, uh, you know, on public transit if they don't have to to get meals. So there, but it, it requires, in my opinion, uh, people coming together around a virtual table, not, not necessarily in a room together, but um, uh, coming together and just um, having a conversation around what the needs are 
you know, sometimes it might require a little mini environmental scan to say, you know, well, what do we really need? And I know from talking with some of you, um, that has already, um, is already being done in terms of um, what are some of the needs that, that people have? Like, for example, um, uh, there's been much discussion around, well, if somebody needs to have uh, testing done, um, you know, how do, where do they go? How do they get there? And what might be the uh, um, value of um, mobile testing? You know, do you, um, do you set up uh, opportunities for people to um, uh, call a number um, and have um, somebody show up to do testing. These are sort of creative ways that people are thinking about um, how things ought to be done or potentially could be done differently. Okay. All right. Um, you have, we have about four minutes left. So uh, another question I have, if, if a person tests positive, how long will the virus take to leave the body of an infected person? Yeah, usually within that period of um, uh, two weeks, one would expect that the virus would um, uh, would leave the body, uh, and and that is um, generally common for several respiratory viruses, where uh, during that first week um, your immune system is struggling with the virus, and during that sick that second week your immune system is just about ready to kick the virus out. So, so generally, um, uh, during that second week, we find that um, the virus is living in the system. Okay. Um, and another question that I have, is it true that COVID testing is less effective for children? For instance, is there a higher chance of false negatives? Um, th there's some truth to that, um, but, uh, the, the truth um, relates to the fact that children are often more likely to be without symptoms compared with their adult counterparts. If you do swabs and pe on people who are without symptoms, you're more likely to pick up negatives than in somebody who has copious amounts of symptoms or is just uh, in the phase that we call the pre-symptomatic phase. So it, it's, a, it's a measure of um, uh, how much virus is there to begin with. But um, uh, once um, uh, you know, the, the swab is done properly, uh, the, the pickup rates in children are really pretty good. Okay, um, I have another question coming in. Uh, oops. There is a report from a study abroad that one can be reinfected by COVID. Is there any data in Canada to support this? So that's a really great question. We don't have um, uh, any data to support that um, uh, at all in a major way around the world. And I wanna put that in perspective for you. So far, uh, we have um, over 30, million people around the world uh, infected, proven to be infected with COVID. Um, and, and the numbers, you know, climb every day. So let, let's, it's, it's more than 30 million. So let's, let's, let's call it 30 million. The reports of a bona fide reinfection um, so far, the last time I checked was about a week ago, were two definite reinfection cases. Let's call that 10, you know, for argument's sake. So you would have uh, 10 cases of reinfection out of 30 million infections. You're looking at one in three million. In other words, less than one in a million chance. A highly, highly unlikely, very rare uh, situation. I hope that puts it in some sort of perspective for you. And then um, I just have one last to finish this portion off. Um, is there anything else that you can tell us about your research? We have people who want to know about your research. Um, and, you know, if there's anything else you want to share with us. Well, yeah, I can, I can share a, a few points um, with respect to the uh, 
uh, antibody study that we call the antibody immunity study. And essentially what we're trying to do is that we're trying to get a better understanding of the extent to which COVID has penetrated into the black community, uh, as well as um, other communities. Uh, and we are also trying to get a better understanding of why. Um, and, and that I think is, is really important. Uh, it's uh, through the process of understanding why we'll be able to better inform policy as to what to put in place so we can, we can help to prevent this from happening and also help individuals. Um, it's, it's also important uh, to note that uh, in the process of doing this, we're measuring two types of antibodies. We're measuring antibody that tells us that somebody had COVID. But we're also measuring an antibody that tells us that what is there in terms of the immune system might offer someone some protection moving forward. The extent of the protection might be variable, but the possibility of some protection, and that's where the neutralizing antibody comes in. So, so the, the data that we get from the project would be directly individual, uh, beneficial to the individual. So they'll have that private information one-on-one, -on -one, they get the result directly beneficial to the individual. In addition to uh, us being able to flesh out who overall is being affected uh, most frequently and how we might be able to identify some of those risk factors that you asked about earlier and how we might be able to uh, identify ways to benefit people, um, uh, inform policy that would benefit people. I, I wanna mention though that um, uh, while this um, project, the antibody immunity project uh, predominantly focuses on the black population, we're also looking at um, all individuals within uh, defined postal code areas, uh, you know, whether or not you're white or South Asian or, you know, East Indian, whatever, we're looking at all comers within the hot zones because it might well be uh, that as we and others suspect, the risk factors um, in certain areas of our city in our country are not defined uh, by race at all but by other factors um, like the types of work that people do. And so um, we are looking at, um, at, at all um, groups. Uh, so that's a, a really important point um, to bear in mind. But at the same time, uh, as I said to, to again, you know, some of my colleagues, um, if you do a study of um, COVID antibody testing across Ontario and 4.5, 7% of the population of Ontario identifies as being black. Then a thousand people studied would only give you 47 black people to analyze. And you basically have to analyze um, uh, something like um, 950 um, people of other races to generate data that you'll extrapolate to the black population. Bottom line is you, 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 black um, folks like me and, and others and some of you on, on this call would need to be part of that so that the data generated can be generalized to us. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Allen. Um, we definitely have some people asking about getting more information. So um, for everyone who's registered, uh, we'll be sure to share the information so that they can get in touch with your team, get more information and possibly participate in the study if they're interested. Um, but thank you so much for your time and explaining all of this and addressing questions and comments from participants. And thank you all. Um, uh, who's in who's part of the AGM and um, asking all your questions in the chat. It's been a very lively chat. So thank you so much for that. Um, I do recognize that not all questions are able to be answered during this session, but um, if you do still want to leave a question, we can try our best to find the answers um, and send it to all registered participants after the AGM. Um, so please feel free to continue asking questions and we'll do our best to get you those answers. 
And just a reminder that this session is being recorded. You will be able to view it on the Black Creek's um, YouTube channel and the website. So it will be available to you. Um, but yeah, thank you again, Dr. Allen, for joining us and providing your insights on this situation. It's really appreciated. Um, and yeah, hopefully we'll be able to hear more about your research. My pleasure. All right, um, so just so everyone's aware, we actually will now be uh, turning to the business portion of the AGM. Okay, so um, welcome everyone to the 31st AGM for the Black Creek Community Health Center. Um, for those of you who did join late, uh, again, my name is Nicola Holness and I am the chair for the board of directors of Black Creek. And I am now calling the calling the business portion of the AGM to order. It is now 726 and we have quorum uh, to meet 50% or greater as per our bylaws. Sorry, okay, uh, for voting. Um, just a reminder that voting is for registered members only. Um, and just so that people are aware, members are uh, for approval assumed approach for each motion, which means that we've already received um, motions. I mean, sorry, we've already received volunteers to move and second motions, um, but you will be called upon to oppose or abstain only through the chat. If you approve a motion, no action is required. But if you oppose or abstain a motion, you must enter your choice in the chat room. If you have any questions regarding a particular motion, please type it in the chat. And if you are using the phone, please unmute and ask your question. Again, it's star six to unmute um, and star nine to raise your hand. Um, to expedite the voting process, um, we'll be asking members to indicate if they oppose or abstain from each motion. So again, um, you don't have to do anything if you approve the motion. All right, so we will be getting started now. Okay, so the first motion, be it resolved that the membership approve the agenda for the 2019 annual general meeting. This motion is moved by Emil and seconded by Abdi. Any objections? Any abstain? Okay, motion has been passed. Next slide. Okay, so members uh, should have received the minutes from our 2018 annual general meeting that was held on September 24th. Um, they also, there's also a link in the chat box for all attendees as well or there should be a link coming up shortly. So I would like to put forward the motion that be it resolved the membership approve the minutes of the 2018 annual general meeting as presented. This motion is moved by Jennifer Hall and seconded by Leanne McLean. Any objections to this motion? Any abstain? Thank you, motion passed. Next slide. Okay, um, so again, just like the minutes, uh, a link to our online annual report would all, will also be found in the chat box. A direct link to the report is also on our website and will also be sent to all registered participants. Um, so um, as the board chair, I just wanna highlight a few things I know for the 2019-2020 year, I think uh, COVID is probably the most memorable of anything that has uh, come up. We've also had some uh, racial tensions uh, north of the border as well as here in uh, Canada. Um, but prior to all of this, we Black Creek did experience some uh, positive highlights that we want to mention. Um, so one of those being our accreditation period. So um, the board and the Black Creek team went through um, a long accreditation process, but we were able to get through it uh, quite successfully um, and received accreditation for the next four years. So uh, we were able to get through that. 
Um, OHT, so um, for those of you who are not aware, the government um, has switched over to Ontario Health and as part of being Ontario Health, um, we have also created our new Ontario Health team. So this is a partnership with a number of different healthcare organizations, um, including the local hospital, um, to come together to provide a well-rounded healthcare services for the community. Um, we're still in the very early stages of developing this partnership, but um, you know, despite all of that, and then the slowdown of COVID, we are expecting this to be a very fruitful um, partnership with everyone. So keep, uh, keep your eye out to hear more about that. Uh, but that's been another highlight of our year. Uh, partnerships. Uh, we have developed partnerships with various organizations in the community. We've received some funding to do some work focused on the Black community. Um, we've connected with the um, uh, North York Women's Shelter to provide healthcare services in their violence against women shelter. Um, and just so really connecting and being a uh, trustee for a lot of smaller organizations in the community as well. Um, so really trying to make as many connections as we can um, to benefit the community at large. Um, and increase service levels as well, um, helping to provide support for more people in the community. We've also switched to an EMR system that's helped us to move uh, digitally and collect all of our data and store our data digitally, which has been quite helpful, I would say, um, during this COVID period. Um, and so a lot of this information is also found in the annual report. Um, and so feel free to read through that. But overall, I think I don't want us to, um, you know, only remember 2019, 2020 as the year of COVID, but also a year that we've been able to um, connect with a lot of different agencies and community members and really try to build our service capacity as much as we can. Next slide. All right, so um, I will be uh, putting forward the motion to approve uh, my chair report. So be it resolved that the membership approve the 2019 board chair report as presented. This motion is being moved by Ola and seconded by Elaine. Um, any objections to this motion? Any abstain? Okay, motion passed. Next slide. Okay, so I will actually be turning um, turning it over to Jericho, who is our board treasurer, and he will be providing our financial report. Yep. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Jericho, the treasurer for Black Creek Community Health Center. Um, all members here should have received the audited report already. And if not, uh, I believe a link will also be posted to chat. Um, additionally, I wanted to note that the board uh, reviewed and approved the audited report earlier this year. Um, at this point, I'm actually going to be passing it off to Derek Chu from Wel Welch LLP uh, to present the audit for fiscal year um, 2019 to 2020, um, if he's here. Perfect. Thank you, Rico. Hi, everyone. This is, my name is Derek Chu. I'm the Sydney Manager at Welch LLP. Uh, thank you, everyone, for inviting me uh, again uh, to your AGM to present the audit financial statements. Uh, and I'd like to report to the board, as well as the members of Black Creek Community uh, Health Center, that we have completed the audit uh, in April and May this year. And the board have completed the review and the approval of the financial statements on May 25th uh, of this year. Uh, while we won't go over the financial details as the financial um, statements has been provided to all the members, uh, I just want to bring up, point out that our audit report this year, which is on page one and two of the financial statements, uh, have continued to be a clean audit report. We have not identified any significant controls issues or accounting issues as we have performed our audit procedures. And, um, and lastly, I do want to also uh, report that 
despite COVID, we had to do the audit slightly differently this year. Um, we have to minimize our presence and uh, our physical presence at uh, doing the audit procedures. Um, so that does require both management um, and the team to do more work to provide us a lot of the information uh, electronically. So I do want to appreciate uh, TLNS and the team and Cheryl and the team's time and the effort to complete the audit on time despite the challenges we have during COVID. Um, so that ends my report on the audit side. Any questions at this point to the membership or uh, as well as the board of directors? If none, I'll pass it back to Jericho. Awesome, thank you, Derek. Uh, next slide then, please. Awesome, okay. So um, seeing that there are no questions regarding the audited uh, report, um, I'm going to be presenting two motions. Uh, the first motion is to approve the audited financial statements for fiscal year uh, beginning April 1st, 2019 and ending March 31st, 2020. Uh, similar to the previous motions as presented by Nicola, uh, these were already moved and seconded by folks ahead of time. Uh, so it was first moved by Beryl and then seconded by Don. Um, are there any questions um, or uh, anyone who is opposed or abstaining from this motion? Okay, uh, seeing none, I will uh, carry this motion and move on to the second one. Um, the second motion is to approve the auditors for the fiscal year beginning April 1st, 2020 uh, and ending next year, March 31st, 2021. Uh, this motion was moved uh, first by Jen and then seconded by Emil. Um, are there any questions or um, is anyone opposing or abstaining from this motion? All right, uh, seeing none, uh, I will also carry this motion. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Jericho. Um, and thank you also, Derek, um, for your report. Um, I'm actually now going to be uh, passing this over to Abdi. He is our chair of the nominations committee, and he will be providing the nominations report. Sorry, I was muted. So thank you, Nicola. Good evening, everyone. So I'm Abdi, as Nicola said. Um, so I just want to update you guys on the current makeup of our board currently. We have about 10 members, but we do have three individuals, uh, Beryl, Don, as well as Jennifer, that their terms were up, but because as you can imagine, the situation with COVID, we couldn't recruit new members this year. So we've asked them to uh, continue to stay with us for another year. And we approved this at an earlier meeting in May. So thank you to Beryl, Don, as well as Jennifer for continuing to stay. We also have a few members that will, uh, that their term has come up for re-election, which I'll get into the next slide. Yeah, so the following um, slate of directors are recommended for re-election to the board. So we have uh, Dana for a first year two term, Elaine for a third and final two year term, Jericho for a third and final two year term, Leanne for a second two year term, and Ola for a second two year term. So I'm going to bring up the motion, uh, be a result that the membership approved the 2020-2021 slate of directors as presented. And this was moved by Jennifer Hall and seconded by Don Smith. If there are no objections or abstains, I would move this motion. Okay, the motion has been moved. All right, thank you, Abdi. So um, one thing I also want to do as well, so Emil Wickham, um, he has completed his terms on the board. So I just wanna um, express a very big thank you to Emil for serving on the board for the past six years. 
Um, and I wish you all the best in your future endeavors. Um, but thank you for all the work you've done and I'm sure we'll continue to do um, within this Black Creek community. So thank you, Emil. All right, can I get the next slide? Okay. Um, so I'm now gonna be passing this over to Cheryl, the ED, and she will be providing her executive director report. Okay, thank you, Nicola. And hello, bonjour, tout le monde, merci. Wanted to be bilingual. Thank you all for attending our keynote session this evening, as well as our AGM. I'd like to add my thanks to Dr. Allen. I, think, I don't know if he's still with us for his informative presentation. Uh, we surely are in a unique time. Uh, it's clear that our actions today will have an impact for many years to come. Um, but before I get started, I'd also like to acknowledge this moment that we're all in, not only because of COVID, but also due to some of the violent incidents and other barriers to the social determinants of health for members of this community. For some, it's a time of pain, struggle, suffering, and loss. Perhaps it's being experienced differently, but nonetheless, it's a moment we're all sharing in at this moment in time. So it's encouraging to see so many of you coming together, even though virtually, in the midst of this challenging time. I hope you, your families, and your colleagues are doing okay despite it all. So while it's our usual practice to reflect and celebrate our successes of the past fiscal year, which Nicola has also has already provided you with, I'd like to, us, for us to take a look into the future. A future of how communities can help us to co-design and co-deliver services to achieve better health outcomes for everyone, regardless of where they live. But before we get there, we have to recognize what this pandemic uncovered and brought to light. While lots of time and resources were put into um, preparing our systems, our healthcare system, our acute care system uh, to, for the pandemic, and many months were um, spent trying to flatten the COVID curve, we were seeing a different curve in this community. There was actually two curves. One that, ex the second curve that not too many people are familiar with exposed the inequities that COVID heightened a curve that existed prior to the time any of us even heard about COVID-19. In this community, we saw the disparities caused by service gaps prior to the declaration of the pandemic. In addition to high, a high prevalence of health conditions such as diabetes, high blood pressure, asthma, individuals struggled with lack of healthy food, high rental costs and evictions, educational issues due to lack of the proper tools to connect to online learning, especially for those larger families. Folks struggled with access to information. People whose first language was not English did not receive information at the same time as those of us speaking English as our first language. This second curve, if you will, showed itself in high case numbers in certain neighborhoods and population groups. Called the, we called them the hotspots, as Dr. Allen alluded to. It shows us the deep health and social inequities that were in existence, which COVID simply accelerated. So how can we flatten this other curve at the same time as we deal with this current second wave of COVID? How can we shift these imbalances in the communities that we see that are being hardest hit, right, like right here in Northwest Toronto? We have the data we heard through uh, Dr. Allen's presentation, Toronto Public Health, showed us the data with the disproportionate impact of the virus on racialized and low-income individuals. First, we have to acknowledge that some of our systems were not designed in a fair way for all of, our, all of those in our communities. It's a system that at times harms rather than heals. For example, the existence of structural racism and other barriers that lead to poor outcomes for some and not for others. We all know the impact of a precarious workforce, of violence, housing and food insecurity, along with those underlying conditions that increases the risk to COVID-19. We see and we hear these stories among the populations we serve, amongst our clients and our community residents. Secondly, we must work better together to build a healthier and more just society. That future must include a system more rooted in communities, 
where community members are listened to and their strengths are validated. A system with more upstream interventions to prevent and reduce visits to the emergency departments of hospitals, which leads to hallway medicine. We heard about this last year as we were developing um, a new system with the Ontario health teams. And so this transformation has begun, but does it need to be accelerated, especially in some areas such as this community? Thirdly, it's a time to amplify community assets as we continue to brace for the challenges to come. Now more than ever, it's a time for leaning into our communities to listen to their voices. If we are truly in this together, like those hashtags for COVID-19, we need to all be part of the solution to rebuild and renew the communities that we work in. And finally, it's time to take this moment and move it into a Take this moment into a movement for thinking of on how culture, health and social justice come together for our communities, not just in our immediate response, but for the long term. This movement has been started by others. Among others, there have been efforts by our provincial CHC association, the Alliance for Healthier Communities and the Canadian Association for Community Health Centers. Initiatives that we here at Black Creek have been part of pushing for like social prescribing or integrated he interprofessional healthcare teams moves us towards a more, more creative and alternative vision for healthcare. This COVID crisis has, offers us an opportunity to accelerate these innovations and for modeling what's possible. We need your help in joining us in this movement. We've all responded to COVID-19 with innovations. We forged new partnerships, deepened relationships. The Black Creek Humber Cluster led by the City of Toronto and the United Way has helped us to do this. Local donors and partners came through with masks, food, household products, funders at all levels of government, the Toronto Foundation, United Way all came through with additional resources but we need to come together as well for longer term solutions that will strengthen our communities and achieve health equity for all. The time is now more than ever to listen to the voices of the community, to amplify these voices, to build on the strengths of what our community offers and build capacity for those living in the community, those who know best what the needs and struggles are I, I urge all of us to reflect and reimagine what community health and well being can look like for everyone. With you, with our partners, our clients, the community residents, I'm confident that we can achieve our vision of a healthy, resilient, and empowered community where people are connected and support each other. I know that we can jointly create a society we are proud of with communities that are healthy and thriving. Early in this pandemic, the world has been showing support and appreciate, appreciation for healthcare workers everywhere, which is well-deserved. So in closing, I'd like to invite you all to make some virtual noise using your thumbs up or clapping reaction buttons at the bottom of your screen for our community members, for our community workers, as well as healthcare workers, and for all of you, our community partners as well, that have risen above and beyond during these times to support your neighbors, your colleagues, and to keep us all safe together. So I'm gonna wait for that virtual noise. Great, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm going to now, in the next slide, just wanted to um, thank our staff and remind us all of those times when we were able to be physically close to each other as we celebrated last year, our 30th anniversary, 30 years of providing services in this community, thanking our community members for inviting us into um, their care. Um, that time will come again. I know that the world will not be a virtual place forever um, and just wish everyone um, health and wellness. Um, and in the next slide, as one of the things that we've done at our AGMs um, in the past is we celebrate milestones of our staff. So in this slide, um, the asterisks on the names are the fo folks who have hit their five year or 10 year mark, but we've also included members who have surpassed that mark. So all of the staff members who've hit five years and beyond, 10 years and beyond, 
15 years and beyond, 20 years and beyond. And I've got to mention Dr. Howard, <laughs> Howard Cho. We have to mention Julie Fung, our dietitian, Marissa, our um, corporate services um, coordinator, and Yolanda Mendoza, our medical secretary, now healthcare coordinator. Thank you all so much for your years of service to the health center, to Black Creek Community Health Center, and to the community. Without you, we couldn't do what we do. Um, and I think that's it for my report. Um, and again, thank you. Thanks everyone who contributed to put this together, in particular our um, uh, leadership team, Doris, Tionest, Michelle, Josie, Patience, and Marissa. Um, thank you all. And I know many of you are working behind the scenes um, and the board members as well. If I don't have a chance uh, at the end of this to thank our board members, um, Emil as well, for your um, service to the center. Without your leadership, again, we wouldn't be here. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. All right, thank you, Cheryl. All right, everyone, so that was the um, ED report. Um, so I will be putting forward the motion to approve the executive report as presented by Cheryl. Um, so this uh, motion has been moved by Leanne and seconded by Ola. Are there any um, opposed or any abstains? Okay, so if there's none, then motion carried. Uh, can we get the next slide? All right, so that wraps up our 2019 annual general meeting. Again, thank you to everybody for attending, um, especially uh, through this virtual form of communication. I know it's not the normal way we do things, but this has become our new normal. And so thank you all for coming and, and um, participating. I will be putting forward the motion to adjourn the 31st AGM. Um, so the motion is that be it resolved that the membership agreed to adjourn the 2019 annual general meeting. This motion is being moved by Elaine and seconded by Jericho. Any opposed or abstain? Okay, so I don't see any, so motion carried. So we are adjourning the meeting at 7.53. Great. And thank you all for joining us and thank you to the board for all your work as well throughout the year. And thank you, of course, to the Black Creek team for all your hard work and dedication. And meeting is adjourned. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs> yep.